Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad to see you here this morning. Let's get underway with hymn number 235. Number 235, God of Grace and God of Glory. So glad to see you on a cold Sunday morning. I hope this will warm you up just a little bit as we enter this third Sunday after Epiphany. And it's also, I believe, Baptism Sunday here at First Presbyterian. Turn with me, if you will, to hymn number 50. Number 50. This is, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. This hymn is a good pairing with our scripture reading this morning from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark where we see the calling of Simon and Andrew and uh, James and John, who are called to follow Jesus. I would do Jesus calls us right above that, but we did that last week at church, so we're going to try to make that Hymn number 50. And just so you know, we're going to sing it to a different tune than the one that's in the book. But that won't be a problem, because you'll know the tune is very familiar. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Secret, help me bear the strain. 
Our prayer hymn today is hymn number 151. 151, and this is a very familiar hymn, Just As I Am Without One Plea. And again, just a little tiny piece of the history. It's a Victorian hymn, actually, written in the mid-1800s by Charlotte Elliott, who was the daughter of a very famous evangelist in, in England. And she suffered a very, very serious illness in her mid-30s and was bedridden for most of the rest of her life. But she took to writing hymns. She wrote about 150 of them. But a lot of her hymns had to do with the fact that, that, that she was disabled, and that she, these hymns deal with uh, approaching God from the point of, this is who I am, this is what I am, I can't help it, I still feel valued. And there was a quote, I, I pulled this out, she said, she once wrote about this hymn, people are not good enough or not good enough to come to Jesus. It's through God's promises and love that we are that are mentioned throughout this hymn that everyone can come to Jesus. So a little backstory on that hymn that makes it mean just a little bit more. 151. South America. 
He's a good kid. He uh, he always sends Joey and I a Christmas present. Well, this year he sent us a live bird. Sat about that high in the cage and everything. He was all green. Had a kind of a red head and a little plumy yellow on top and a big beak. Well, I'm going to tell you, that bird was delicious. <laughs> Julie and I had him for Christmas dinner and had some dressing and cranberry sauce and collards and black-eyed peas. I mean, it was delicious. Well, a day or two after Christmas, my nephew called. I want to know if we got the bird. I said, yeah, we got him. He was delicious. He said, you didn't eat that bird, did you? I said, well, of course we did. He said, good heavens. I mean, he pissed a pit. He said, that bird was expensive. I mean, he, he was worth a lot of money. And he could speak two languages. Two languages. I said, well, he should have said something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, Sandy will continue with her fascinating education on other religions. <laughs> well, a lot of faces this morning. We, Mom said when we got when we got in the car, it's going to be you and me this morning. I, <laughs> I said, well, I'm glad to see everybody here. And uh, Blair, I feel very bad this year this morning. I hope you do as well. Uh, not a, what Lane didn't tell you was Harry Emerson Fosdick's first pulpit was First Baptist Church, Montclair, New Jersey. And so he was Baptist. And then, of course, I didn't have to look at the words for just as I am. <laughs> if you grow up Southern Baptist, you know that one by uh, heart. All right, so last week we talked about the defining the origin of the people of Israel and what a challenge it is, and how that's an ongoing conversation within the tradition itself regarding what it is to be a Jew. This week, what I want to do is talk about various Jewish movements, how they evolve, and what they say about, different Jew about Jewish life and practice. So you're not going to be surprised because you all know me well enough now to say you've got to do some history to get ready for that. So let's talk a little history first. After the Romans destroyed the second temple in 70 of the Common Era, many Jews were uh, scattered abroad yet again. Remember, there was the first exile after 587, 86 BCE, where Jews were scattered about. Well, many Jews this time went and joined communities that were established during that exile after the second exile, and that means there were Jews around Asia Minor, North Africa, even up into Greece, Rome, and Spain. These communities uh, were important, but there were also still Jews in Palestine, most specifically the cities of Safed, which is right, if you've been to the Sea of Galilee, you can go up to the beautiful city of Safed, Tiberias, which is right on the Sea of Galilee, Sepphoris, which is a next-door neighbor to Nazareth um, in a city that Jesus probably knew. This became the center of Jewish life in Palestine. And you can still visit some of the um, remnants of that today. But things were not calm for Jewish communities, both abroad or at home. Abroad, there were lots of conflicts that between Jews and the people in the cities where they were living. And so that was causing turmoil. And then you might not know that there was a second Jewish revolt led by a man named Simon Bar Kokhba, and that was in 132 BCE. It was a fairly successful revolt. Rome had not really secured Jerusalem very carefully, and so Jerusalem was even taken again for a time by Jews. But the Romans took care of that pretty much, and any hope, of a reestablishment of a Jewish life in Palestine, in Jerusalem. Any hope of rebuilding a temple yet again was pretty much gone after 132 and the Bar Kokhba revolt. So, one of the things that you have to 
to recognize is that as a Jew, Jewish leaders began to talk about both abroad and at home, how is our tradition going to survive? What are we going to do to make certain that without the temple, we still have a life as Jews and a way of living that people can follow wherever they go? Books were a big part of the answer. This is how we get to be the people of the book. <laughs> this is where that results. You'll remember that I told you that the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, going back to last time, everybody's got to remember last fall, um, this was the major Jewish scripture. And we know that we had already gotten the Torah together after 587 86 BCE. We know that the prophets, the Nevi'im, were together by the second century BCE. But in this period, after the fall of the second temple, the Ketuvim, or the writings, the rest of the canon, was pulled together and authorized as scripture. And so we have the Tanakh, which is sometimes just called the Torah. So Torah can refer to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It can sometimes be referenced as the whole Tanakh. But one of the things you got to know about this story is that Torah was not just Tanakh. Jews taught that there was Torah Shabbat. That means the written Torah. And there was Torah Shabbat Peh, or Peh, depending on how you want to say it, which means the oral Torah. And for the Jewish community, both things were given to Moses at Mount Sinai. So when Moses came back off that mountain with the tablets, they weren't just the Ten Commandments, there was the whole of the written Torah, which is Tanakh, but there was also this oral tradition. And they said this oral tradition was passed down generation to generation in learning. Now, that was a bit controversial within Judaism itself. Jesus' time, the Sadducees said, uh-uh, no oral Torah. It's not written down, it ain't Torah. No way. Pharisees were like, no, 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 we got the oral Torah. <laughs> we got this down. So this was a controversial concept within Judaism itself. But the oral Torah was really the focus of this period, because they had the written Torah, we got the Tanakh, but what are we going to do with the oral Torah, all the ways that the Torah itself is enacted, all the things that we've been taught about the Torah over time? That would have been Agadah, which are stories, and Halakha, which are pronouncements. So Agadah is really interesting. Agadah is stories or explanations, whereas halakha, which means to walk in Hebrew, is the way you live it out. It's like all the ways that the Torah is enacted, a restatement and an expansion. What are we going to do to preserve that oral Torah now that we're living all over the place? How are we going to make that happen? Enter a guy named Judah Hanasi. He said, we got to get this oral Torah written down. Which kind of is a, is a little bit of an oxymoron, but nonetheless, we're going to preserve the oral Torah. And so he sets out to do the Mishnah. And that's what the oral Torah is. Mishnah means repeat. And so all the things that had been repeated over time, they wanted to compile and put into a collection. And Judah Hanasi was the chief of the editors and compilers of this document. They organized it into six distinct sections. Because what they did was they said, we're going to scour the Tanakh and get all of the major laws, and then we're going to organize it into six sections. And those six sections are agricultural laws, because that was a lot of it, Sabbath and festivals, 
because we want to know how the regulations about that are. Women, women get their own category. <laughs> and so that was all the regulations that have to do with marriage and family and divorce and all the things that have to do with women. Damages, this is one of my favorites. This is civil law. What happens if you're off score somebody, you know, in a field? So you have damages. Sacred things, which is the sacrificial system, offerings and donations, and then laws of purification, purity laws. Now that may sound like to you, okay, what they came up with was a law code. Don't think that. <laughs> Do not think that in any way. Because it does it's not a traditional kind of law code. Rather, it's a conversation. It's a recording of a conversation. The Mishnah basically is, if I try to tell you what it's like, I use the Supreme Court as an example. When the Supreme Court issues a ruling, it'll say, we voted, you know, five to four, and we decided this. And then what will they do? They'll issue a majority opinion, but more than one justice might write for the majority. And if somebody wants to write for the minority, they might, and there might be another minority opinion. That's what the mission is like. The mission is like, here's the law, and here's what Rabbi thus and such says about it, but here's what Rabbi thus and such had to say. And so it's this conversation, and it's not always coherent, because they wanted to preserve the conversation and everything that was important to it. Now, my Supreme Court uh, analogy holds up here, too. Because even though the minority may not have won on a point, the way that they argued it might still be important to jurisprudence down the line. And so a minority opinion in the Mishnah may not be the majority custom, but it still is important. They preserve the plurality of Jewish life in the Mishnah, even as they wrote it down. But they weren't done yet. That was about 200 of the common era that we get the Mishnah. But rabbis being rabbis kept talking, wherever they were. And what results from those conversations is called the Gemara, the completion or the rest of the story. In Palestine, the Gemara was compiled over two centuries, the third century and the fourth century. In the Babylonian region, it was three centuries, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And the Gemara, sometimes people will tell you, is a commentary on the Mishnah. Don't ever let them tell you that. It's in part a commentary on the Mishnah, but it's so much more than that. It is, again, a conversation about all of the ways that the rabbinic interpretation is done all of the possibilities for interpreting the Tanakh and how Jewish life is lived out. And it is story, and it is pronouncement. What they did then was they took the Mishnah and they added it to the Gemara, and that equals the Talmud. So Mishnah and Gemara are Talmud. And Talmud is right behind Tanakh, fundamental to Jewish life. It is Jewish life and practice distilled. But guess what? Two versions of the, ta of the Talmud. The Babylonians, because they have a different Gemara, have a Babylonian Talmud, and then, then there's a Palestinian or a Jerusalem Talmud. So same Tanakh, same Mishnah, but different Gemara, so you get two Talmuds. Now, I will just tell you that both persisted over time, but the Babylonian Talmud has been the dominant one. So that's the one that mostly guides Jewish life. Now, Mishnah and Gemara equals Talmud. So you say, okay, Sandy, I'm going to go home this afternoon, and I'm going to get the Talmud, and I'm going to pull it out and read it. Do not do it. <laughs> because... It reads, like, it reads like obscure shorthand that you will not understand. <clears throat> because the rabbis all knew the context, right? If they're arguing about a purification rite, 
They know all the details of that right. And so they're just arguing the substance of it, and it's written in shorthand without any of the context. So if you don't know the context, what the rabbis say makes no sense. That's why you have yeshivas where these rabbis study this stuff most of their lives. Because you really have to build skill in reading it. I remember when I took rabbinic Hebrew. It was a nightmare. <laughs> um, but when I was taking rabbinic Hebrew at Duke, they give you some passages from the Talmud to read. And rabbinic Hebrew is not pointed. And it has no vowels. So first of all, you've got to learn to read it that way. But then second of all, it's written in this elliptical style that makes no grammatical sense. So you never had any sense of whether you were right, wrong, where you were going. You'd walk into class and they'd say, translate. You'd be like, well, this is what I got. And they'd be like, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and you'd be like, that's it, <laughs> And they were like, well, that's the whole conversation, right? That's the whole conversation. So the rabbis put together this document. Now, the Talmud becomes the foundation for Jewish life for centuries, millennia even. So one of the things we talk about in scholarship is that you have the prehistory period in Jewish life, you know, when the people were forming. You have the period of ancient Israel. You have the second temple period. And then you have the rabbinic period. And the rabbinic period stretches until about the 1790s. So from the second century to the 1790s. That's a long stretch. And the Talmud, the Tanakh and the Talmud make it possible for Jewish life, wherever it landed, to be fairly consistent. Still, differences arise. And differences arise mostly due to culture or where you happened to land. You might have heard of these terms, Sephardic and Ashkenazi. They are two different dominant groups of Jews. Sephardic is a word that means Spanish. So this was the group that settled, of Jews, who settled predominantly in Spain, but also North Africa, the Middle East, and parts of Southeastern Europe. And so if your Jewish ancestry traces back to one of those areas, chances are you are Sephardi. That is Jewish in that tradition. One of the things that's interesting about that group is they developed their own language. It's called Ladino. And so there was a language that Jews used that was Ladino, which has fallen out of use today. But occasionally you still hear it. I had students in Italy one year. And we were in a synagogue in Italy, and I'm listening to it, and I'm, I looked at the person that was guiding us. I said, she's singing, but I don't, it's not Hebrew. He's like, no, it's Ladino. Never had heard it. It was stunning, it's beautiful, it's melodic, but it was still, Ladino was the language. Sometimes in these circles, you might see a different term. Mizrahim. I didn't write that one down. Mizrahim. That's a 20th century term that tries to say if you're from the Middle East, you're Jewish in this tradition. Uh, I don't particularly think it's useful, but some, you might hear it. Ashkenazi is a, comes from a word that means German. And so for the Germany, France, that part of the world, this were Jews that were settled in that region and then who went over, their uh, ancestors went over into Eastern Europe. So if you're talking about Northern European traditions of Judaism, you're talking Ashkenazic Jews. Yiddish comes in these communities, which is a combination of Hebrew and German. And so that's where you get a lot of the Yiddish words that we have today. Now, um, at there are other kinds of Jews. We can talk about Yemeni Jews, Ethiopian Jews, Asian Jews, but these two groups are dominant. And in America, about 80% of Jews 
descend from Ashkenazic Jews. That's due to immigration patterns of Jews into America. So that's something to know about that. The differences between these groups are not intense. That is theologically because they all had Tanakh, they all had Talmud. Theologically, they're not all that different in what they teach. But there's some practices and cultural things that vary. Things that, traditions about what you wore, for instance. Traditions about whether on this holiday you have latkes or jelly donuts. Um, a trace down to what, what region you came from. Traditions in how you pronounce things. Is it Shabbat or Shabbat? Um, these are things that trace back to those kinds of cultural differences. But they are not, uh, you know, really significant. But I want to start here. Late 1790s, this is where it gets really important for us in the modern contemporary world. In this country, we're having a revolution, right? You know, American Revolution. In France, what are they doing? Having a revolution. One of the things you see are that all of this new philosophy about individual rights and freedom, overthrowing monarchies, is happening. And what that's doing to the Jewish community is fascinating. Some of these communities, for the first time, Jews are able to claim rights as citizens of countries. They're able to go to schools, attend universities, seek out jobs that they want to seek. Jews call this period the emancipation because they're not assigned to ghettos anymore and they're not forced to live on the margins of these societies, but rather they're invited to participate. But you got to figure some things out, right? How do you keep kosher at a business lunch? You know, you're, you're, you're out there in the world conducting business. Can you keep kosher? It's tough. What about the clothes you wear? Do you want to wear distinctive clothing? What about the ways in which you conduct your life? How do you as a Jew maintain yourself as a Jew but also live in the modern world? So we enter into what we call in the 1790s the age of diverse Judaism, which is really poorly labeled because Judaism has always been diverse. <laughs> so it's like while it's called the age of diverse Judaism, it's, Jewish life has always been diverse, but this was particularly important. Now, all these new possibilities out there in the world, in 1810, I think it is, in Sessin, Germany, a Reformed synagogue opened. Protestants had their Reformation. Well, the Jews did too. And so the Reform movement starts in Germany. And this was trying to figure out how Jews could live in the modern world and still be Jewish. And so a couple of the things that they were saying is like, well, one thing we're going to do is we're going to do the liturgy in German, not just necessarily in Hebrew, so that people will be comfortable with it. We're going to do mixed gender seating. <gasps> you know, we're not going to separate men and women. We're going to go back, by the way, to an old tradition, because that separation of men and women is not in ancient Judaism. It's in Middle Ages and beyond Judaism. But they went back to the old school, and did mixed gender seating. They started doing things that they had seen in uh, Christian traditions, choirs and cantors. You know, they were like, well, the Christians sing, and it's right nice. Let's do it, too. <laughs> and then, I think one of the other things, one-day-long festivals. That way, you could take a single day off, but not have to be doing something for a week. So it made it more amenable to work. These communities were different from traditional Jews in that they could hold that the Torah, all of it, oral and written, was not necessarily written by God when it came down off of Mount Sinai. Modern biblical scholarship was teaching them that maybe human hands 
had something to do with this too. So Reformed Judaism was different from traditional Judaism in that it was more open to modern academic biblical ideas. It was more open to education outside of the Jewish community, period, end of sentence. Additionally, they believed that every generation has to work out the commands of God in accord with its own needs, and that some of the commands were outdated and could be dispensed with. Not 613 binding this vote and a whole tradition of exactly what you had to do. So you can see another difference. They weren't looking for the coming of the Messianic age where there would be a universal age of peace, a resurrection of the dead, a restored kingdom of Israel, and the temple would rebuild and sacrifices would start again on the altar. Rather, they were talking about something called, and you might have heard this term, Tikkun Olam. This was what the goal of Jewish life was. Improvement of the world. Making the world a better place. It was their job to carry forward what God wanted in the world. You didn't have to wait for the Messiah to show up. You had to make the world a better place. These were some distinctives of the reform movement. The first reform synagogue in the U.S., who knows where it is? It'll surprise you. Charleston, South Carolina. Bet Elohim, 1824. It was Sephardic. So it didn't come out of the German tradition. It came out of Slovak. But it was a Sephardic synagogue in Charleston in 1824. Um, what I want you to know about this is the reform movement grew pretty quickly in America. And by the 1880s, it was centered um, around a group that developed in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's where the Hebrew Union schools are. And Hebrew Union is, a, a, is important to the reform movement. And uh, about 37% of American Jews today are reform. Your neighbor, Temple uh, Beth Emanuel, is reform. So that's a reform congregation. Temple Emmanuel. Orthodox Jew was a, a tradition that came into use, or a word that came into use, in the 19th century. And it was from the reformers back onto traditional Jewish community. I liked uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch, 19th century Jewish ra German rabbi, who said, Orthodox Jews didn't introduce this word into the conversation. It was those modern progressive Jews who applied this name to old, backward Jews as a derogatory term. The name was resented by older Jews, and rightfully so. Eventually, over time, however, they embraced the term orthodox. Right faith is what that means. You may also sometimes hear Torah Judaism. Now, there are many orthodox subgroups. I'm going to tell you about a couple. Um, in the United States, most Orthodox Jews today are what we call modern or central Orthodox. Ironically, they're the ones who are trying to blend traditional Judaism with a modern way of life. So they're trying to do exactly what Reformed Jews were doing in the 1700s and the 1800s. But we can't neglect ultra-Orthodox Jews, and that is a, a common term. Or, uh, Ultra-Orthodox Jews are typically marked by clothing, um, men wearing the hats, kippah, the fedoras, women wearing the wigs or other head coverings. They typically don't intermarry, and they typically don't have live separately. That tends to be ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities. You see it mostly in cities. Um, they are divided into Hasidic Jews and Yeshivist Jews. Hasidic Jews... Uh, emphasized Talmud study, and in Greensboro, the Chabad Jewish Center is a Chabad Lubavitcher Hasidic community. So if you want to know, we have that here in our city as well. Now, back in the day, with Orthodox Jews and Reform Jews not getting along, the conservatives came along in the 1840s, and they said, okay, we don't want to go as far as the Reformers went, but we don't want to be back here where the Orthodox are, so we're in the middle ground. One of their mottos is tradition and change. 
They came over to America. They centered in Pittsburgh. Uh, and the Jewish Theological Seminary of America is key here. It was the dominant expression of American Judaism in the 20th century, but it's on the decline now. Um, and it, it's interesting, Temple, uh, uh, what's the one in Greensboro? Uh, Faith Israel is the one here in Greensboro. No, Bethel, excuse me. It's Bethel in Greensboro. So I would also throw in Reconstructionist Jews, which were founded by Mordecai Kaplan. They say that what we're trying to do is preserve Jewish culture and life. They are very progressive. Uh, Rabbi Kaplan started, uh, had the first bat mitzvah. It was of his own daughter, Judith. So in 1921 or 22, I think. There's other groups, Jewish renewal, humanistic Judaism, but this are sort of denominations of a sort within Jewish life in America. If you're in Israel, it's different. And I've got to get this in fast. Haredi are ultra-Orthodox. Dati are Orthodox. Mazorti are the vast majority of people who are like, yeah, maybe we observe, maybe we don't. And Hilonim are secular Jews. So that's the way you think about it in Israel. So we go in this designation from a Jewish community that was always diverse, but grounded in Tanakh and Talmud, and carried across centuries to this really diverse picture of Jewish life today. And what's most interesting about it is that for the large majority of Jews, both in America and Israel, the cultural identity of Judaism is predominant and the religious expression less important. You will find that a lot of Jews, when they're looking for a congregation, don't go, like, I've got to find a reformed synagogue, or I've got to find a conservative synagogue. They'll say, I've got to find a community where I fit. And that tends to be the way that it goes in America today. Less identification with these movements, and more identification with the cultural aspect of being a Jew. I'm tired. <laughs> yes, Jim. What about their last name? Sometimes Jewish people have a very distinctive last name. Usually those are cultural artifacts depending on where your family is from. Mm -hmm. How common is interfaith marriage these days? Interfaith marriage is extremely common and it's one of the big difficult things that Jewish um, communities face. Reform communities have always been open to interfaith marriage, and they are open to letting you be defined as Jewish whether mama or daddy is Jewish, or if you convert. Whereas Orthodox is moving towards the father, but still sticks with the mom. Conservative is gone sort of wishy-washy in the middle. Um, so it's been sort of interesting. But interfaith marriage is one of the big it was one of the big dividing lines with whether or not you allowed it. Um, it's not so much anymore because it's so common. Yeah, Al. The congregations in Greensboro have their own schools for the young children. Do they go through all of this? Please? Yeah, most of them know it pretty well. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's Jewish history. It's Jewish history. Yeah. Anybody else? I know what we see conflict in the Middle East and Israel now. Are the conflicts concerning, like, what Netanyahu wants to do, that type of thing. Are those conflicts within the communities based more on differences in various uh, traditions, or are they more typical political things? He's got a great question, and I'm going to repeat it so everybody could have heard, could hear it. He said, are the conflicts going on in Israel now, like about the Supreme Court and some of the things, about this, or are they more typical political things? My answer is both. Um, Israel is a parliamentary system with political parties, but those political parties sometimes have um, theological bases. You have religious political parties. And Netanyahu's current coalition, which we'll talk about in a couple weeks because I figured everybody's going to want to know it, <laughs> um, is uh, predominantly made up of religious groupings. Now, what's interesting about that is that 
most of these far right religious groups never wanted anything to do with the state of Israel because the state of Israel was secular. Zionism is a secular movement. And so the Orthodox Jews really didn't like the establishment of the state of Israel because they thought the Messiah should be doing it, not politics. So that's sort of been changing over time, and that's one of the big controversial things today within Israeli society is the role of these ultra-Orthodox groups and their role in settlement um, and you know the expansion of Jewish sort of understanding of what our land is. But that's a complicated question. I want to give a whole section to that. Anybody else? Yeah, one more. Mystical aspect of Judaism that a lot of celebrities are involved in. Is it Kabbalah? Kabbalah yeah. comes out of the Hasidim movement, which is a spiritual movement in the you know in the middle here. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's not. I mean, it's it's a mysticism within the Jewish tradition, but not separate as a as a whole grouping. Yeah, a different way of understanding scripture and interpretation and things. All right, thank you so much. Hmm. I'm going to tell you, I heard a lot of stuff this morning, stuff I didn't know. But I guess the Jews are just, just like us. We got Baptists and Episcopalians and Catholics and everything else. Right. Nobody's really got it all together, it doesn't seem like that for us. <laughs> Will you bow your heads in prayer, please? Kind Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings and your giving us the Christ child to teach us to learn and give to others. Thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we enjoy in your house of worship. Thank you, Lord, for our leadership and unselfish guidance in our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Get a chance to see Blair speak to her. I'm really proud of her.